there is such a huge spotlight on players at the moment. And once again this morning, I was I was absolutely devastated, to be honest, to read about Kurt Zuma. Mm. And we've, heard, we've seen so much negative PR. I just wonder if there's enough that's being done outside of the football to show these players that they are massive role models and how how they've really got to watch themselves. You, I mean, you went through it, but it wasn't mm. quite as bad in your day because there weren't mobile phones. Mm. Do you think that there needs to be something to, to help these players to behave in the right manner? Um, possibly uh, with the clubs. I, f I feel could probably do a little bit more with the players as well, but obviously there's a responsibility with us or with them as players as well, kind of away from the, from the pitch. So they're probably in the, around the training ground for four or five hours of the day. That means they're at home for 19, 20 hours yeah. of the day. You know, so it's a lot of responsibility on, on those people and stuff. But like we say, like I see a video of, of Jack Grealish at the game the other day. Yeah. I've seen that a million times with Jack. Jack is the nicest kid you could, honestly, that you could meet. He would do anything for the supporters, for people. And when you see that, it's like people have made such a big thing of it. I'm like, Jack does that. Jack literally would sit there at six, seven o'clock at night, Aston Villa. Me and Dean would go in the dressing room and Jack would have these, all his uh, fan mail set out, replying to everyone, doing videos for people on Instagram. And it's, it's that side of it that, that, again, with him, people kind of build him up and then mm. want to knock him off that pedal store as well. So I think it's, it's a bit of both. It's the players, but it's also the media as well that can, that can help with that. I mean, you look quite emotional about it and I can understand because you had the same. And I have to admit, I had to defend you so many times over the years because of certain things going mm. on. Yeah. And I always used to say, Yes, this, but have you seen the way he deals with some of the children who come to the training ground mm. who are dying of cancer? I never forget one of the things you said to a boy. I was in bits. I couldn't say a word to him. Mm. And you said something that I know would have been the last thing that he remembered before he died. Mm. Sorry. I feel We're both going to go, yeah. But it, it's hard, and I think people forget what players have to deal with on that side of things mm. and how they can be role models. But I, I do think there's so much negative PR. Yeah, there is. And... I, th I think with it, I, I think us as players look at it and go, like, obviously, I, I probably received a hell of a lot of negative press. I would like the people that work with me, like you being one of them, to go, well, I've seen John X. That means more to me than anything else because the people from the outside who don't know John Terry or don't know me personally or don't know these people individually are very, very quick to make judgment on people. And I don't think that's fair either. We've all made mistakes. We're all young. These kids they're so young they're in the limelight it's difficult at times and yes i've made mistakes other kids make mistakes it's how you kind of learn from that as well but we're very fortunate to be in our position as well to to be able to gift these kids their last wish you know i'm an ambassador for make a wish and seen some horrendous incidents with families and stuff but they're there at chelsea it's down to us our responsibility to see that and give them their final wish and let them run out of the training ground, come in the dressing room. And again, Mourinho was a big part of that. Yeah. And it's, it's that side of it that stays with you. So for all the negative press, I, I look at one incident of, of where I've made a family or a kid happy. That takes it all away from me. Do you ever have regrets that you're not more widely loved? Um, obviously, the Chelsea fans adore you, mm. but for other things that perhaps that aren't anything to do with football? You know what? I, I promise you this now. The only thing that matters to me is that the Chelsea supporters love me. And if I didn't have that, I promise I would be heartbroken. Like I'll give, I give everything to Chelsea Football Club for 22 years. And if I can't, if that shifted that way, uh, it would break me. Honestly, it really would. So um, I'm very happy that I've got my banner. I've got the respect and, and the love of the Chelsea fans because, again, they're the people that see me week in, week out not just on the pitch, but off the pitch as well, and, and many things I've done for the Chelsea supporters. So um, I'll continue to do that, and I hope that I, I continue to get the love and support from, from Chelsea. And, of course, they want you back. I mean, you're there uh, doing a consultancy role um, with the academy, which is great. Mm. Is, that, is that the long-term plan, to come back and be manager of Chelsea Football Club? Yeah, that's, that's my dream. Obviously, when you're a kid, you go, you want to play in the first team. As, as a coach, and I've shifted this way now, the long-term ambition and goal is to be Chelsea manager, of course. That feels a little bit funny saying that because someone's in a job there and, you, you know, listen, we're still talking 10, 15 years down the line maybe, you know, but I have to have an end goal and that's it. It's my dream. Hopefully it happens. I'm on the process of doing that, but a lot of things in between that have to go very well for me. So I'm being very patient in, in this, the decisions I'm making of my next step in, in terms of management. 
but being back at Chelsea is, um, is very pleasing for me and quite emotional when I first drove in. I bet. Um, I know you're working really hard at it as well. I see you reading loads of books, looking at psychology, growth mindsets. Um, talk to me about some of the extra efforts you've put in to be a great manager. <laughs> well, again, I think it's you just try and be a better version of yourself. And I've, I've played under so many great managers and even the managers I didn't enjoy playing under, I still take the bad bits from them that I would never want to be like as well. Can, so I, can I ask who? Who <laughs> no, did you no. enjoy playing under? I think under? the Chelsea fans would know. <laughs> can I um, ask? I mean, there was a bit of a period where people said, um, I don't know, maybe under Di Matteo or Avram Grant or a few of the managers where they actually said John Terry's in charge, frankly. Um, he's the boss thing. He makes a lot of decisions. There was a lot of player power because there was such a strong... You had the captains of so many countries, didn't you, at the time? You mm. had Essie and you had Drogba, you had Balak. Um, how much truth was there to that? And also, has that helped you think that you can be a manager because of that kind of leadership that you were showing as a player? Mm, no, definitely completely untrue in terms of players kind of in charge making decisions. And I think the reason why we had so much success at Chelsea in, in my time, we always had one man in charge and that was the manager we had such a you would have seen on a daily basis we had such a strong group of players that helped that process if we could help that manager whether it be with talking to him or discussing things with him or helping the process of lots of things before it even gets to him and nip stuff in the bud there was stuff in training that Mourinho never had to do because players didn't accept it if someone wasn't to the level or to the standards that, that we demanded as Chelsea Football Club, and we'd seen like me, Frank, Didier, Ash, Pete, we could go on for forever. If people didn't continue to be at those standards, before the manager even said anything, we would nip it in the bud. And that, that's what we've done, that's what big characters we had within the group. And even a couple of times, you know, we'd go in the dressing room and there'd be screaming arguments and we'd be, we'd be battering each other. The manager would come in and go, you've done my job for me. And then he can concentrate on the tactical side of it. And they're, they're the little bits where that was what we knew. That was what brought the best out in us and that, that was what worked for us at the time. I'm not saying it works now or would work in 10 years, but that was what worked for us. So those stories of us being in charge, completely untrue. Um, but we did have a big group. Yeah. Um, as Piliqueta, he's a great captain. Mm. Very different from you, actually. Mm. But um, I just wonder what you think of him and also who would be the successor because he's, you know, he's getting on in his years now. Yeah. Um, he's been superb, Aspie, and like you say, there's many ways to skin a cat, and he's, he does it differently. Um, his performances, first and foremost, have to speak for itself, and his performances certainly do that. So I think when you're captain, it's important that you're, you're a consistent performer week in, week out. When you play, you give a solid 7, 8 out of 10 every week. Aspie does that for the group, and again, he's that example for, for everyone else to follow. I love what he does, but I think the progression from that, or when Aspie... Uh, decides to go would probably lead itself to a Mace for me. I think Mace has got the ability to to go on and, and grab the the game by the scruff of the neck, of the neck if we need to. Um, the Chelsea fans relate to him. He's Chelsea through and through. His family are as well. And I just, yeah, I, I would personally love to see Mace and me. That would be amazing. Mm. Me too. Um, since we're talking about Chelsea through and through and best mates, let's talk about Declan Rice, shall we? I mean, everyone wants to see him at the club, right? Um, can you give him a cheeky nudge? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get in trouble here from the West End. <laughs> now, you know what? De Dex is obviously, he loves Chelsea. I think everyone knows that. I think the rejection he had from Chelsea has, has really helped his career, actually. Mm. What he's done at West Ham is, is pretty much incredible. Um, and we see the other day, even in the cup, when he comes on and scores and, and again grabs the game by the scruff of the neck. With the great dance moves as well. Uh, Did I you make some moves actually decent, actually, from Deck, wasn't it? I want to see more of that, by the way. I Why think, don't more players I do think it? there's been more coming because right. a lot of us can't dance as well. <laughs> <laughs> but I think from, from Deck's side of things, I think he's, he's given everything to, to West Ham. And, and for me, and looking from the outside, unless West Ham go and make a big statement in the summer and go and spend 100 plus million saying, we want to keep Deck and we want to bring in top players like you whether that be a link or whoever that may be, then I think he's got a decision to make. I think if West Ham go and spend huge amounts of money and bring in top players, then again, I think it's difficult for him to kind of walk away. He'd be a wonderful addition. Very incredible. Um